The world today continues to be one great mission field, even in countries that have a long history of Christian traditions. The late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, once said, It is not enough for us to discover Christ. We must also bring him to others. I find it interesting, I just read this on the news last night, the Synod or the Council of Bishops of Africa has been meeting in Rome the last several weeks, and they just concluded and issued their statement and they've called upon Catholic politicians in Africa who cannot function publicly as Catholics to either repent of their actions and change their ways or resign from office. No names were mentioned, but the two most prominent Catholic politicians in Africa who are notorious for ignoring the teachings of the church are President Eduardo dos Santos of Angola and President Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. I did not even know he was a Catholic. What an embarrassment. The bishops of Africa then wrote these strong words. What has happened to our traditional African sense of shame? Africa needs saints in high political office, not sinners. And perhaps our own bishops need to use the same strong words. What has happened to the American sense of shame? That we abort more children than any other country in the world. America needs saints in high political office, not sinners. Now I tell you, there is someone who has been watching the situation in the world, in Africa, in America, in Australia, and in so many countries where religion is increasingly ignored. And she has given us this strong message on May the 2nd of this year. It's an exceptional message because it is not brief, like most of her messages. Listen to these words of Our Lady. Dear children, for a long time now, I've been giving you my motherly heart and offering my son to you. You are rejecting me. You are permitting sin to overcome you more and more. You are permitting sin to master you and to take away your power of discernment. My poor children, look around you and look around at the signs of the times. Do you think that you can do without God's blessing? Do not permit darkness to envelop you. Cry out for my son from the depths of your heart. His name disperses even the greatest darkness. I will be with you. You just call me and say, Here we are, Mother. Lead us. The way to him can be difficult and painful, but do not be afraid. I will be with you. I find that to be an extraordinary message of Our Lady. It is so acute, right to the heart. And she is right. More and more, sin is mastering us. It is controlling us. It's taking away our power of discernment, our ability to be able to decide what is right and what is wrong, to weigh things and to evaluate things. We just take whatever the media tells us without questioning it. We've allowed Satan, with all his empty promises, to deceive us into thinking that the church's way, God's way, is outdated and unrealistic. And that the way of the world, the secular way, is the way that makes sense and the church should get moving with the times. But it is not the mission of the church to move with the times. It is the mission of the church to move the times. For the church is founded upon an immovable rock and even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what the name Satan means. Satan, Satan, means the deceiver or the trickster. And here's an example how Satan has managed to deceive even many of the most faithful among us. Remember, Jesus warned us about this. He said, in the last days, even the strongest believers, the most faithful, will follow the Antichrist. Here's an example. In dealing with many young couples who experience marriage problems and handling many annulment cases for Catholics over the years, 
I'm finding that many of the younger couples are not experiencing marriage difficulties or going through divorce because of adultery or abuse or other serious problems. They simply can't live with one another. And we call these grounds incompatibility. By and large, they are from families where they are the only child. They are the result of our post-contraception generation where they are the only child or one of two children. Not because their parents were unable to have more children, but because their parents did not want to have more children. And these young spouses grew up as children who had their own rooms, their own clothes, their own toys, their own TVs, their own everything. They never learned how to share. They never had hand-me-downs. They never had to wait for their turn. They never had to negotiate or compromise with a sibling. They always got their way because they had no competition. They also experienced something else interesting. They would apologize to their parents and make up because they were the authority figures. But they rarely had to apologize to a peer, to another child their own age, because they had no peers at home. So they often had problems relating to other children at school. And when the teacher would contact their parents, the parents immediately flew to the defense of their child. Their child was never wrong. When these children grew up and married, they found they did not like sharing, even with the person they professed to love. And these young couples do not know how to share, to let someone else go first. They do not know how to negotiate or compromise. They cannot apologize and make up. And when something goes wrong, they run to their parents. And there, if there's pressure to admit that they are wrong, they consider this to be mental abuse. And so they say they're divorcing because of mental abuse. And interestingly enough, the new fashion in building homes here in the United States, which has just arrived in Australia, is not to have a master bedroom for the couple, but to have two master bedrooms, one for the husband and one for the wife, with a little connecting room in between where they can meet. This is true. Look at the home sections in the newspapers on the weekend. And so the couple can continue to live they lived the way they lived at home when they were children, each with their own rooms. Satan has deceived us into thinking that if we have fewer children, we will have happier children and happier marriages, and this has not worked. Satan has tricked us. On March the 2nd of this year, Our Lady has this to say. Dear children, I'm here among you. I'm looking into your wounded and restless hearts. You have become lost, my children. Your wounds from sin are becoming greater and greater and are distancing you all the more from the real truth. You are seeking hope and consolation in all the wrong places. Well, I'm offering to you sincere devotion, which is nurtured by love, sacrifice, and truth. I'm giving you my son. This isolation of married couples, each in their own rooms, is based on an upbringing that is focused on the, on the good idea of children give, of parents giving their children all the best things in life. But of course, to most people, the best things in life mean food, clothing, shelter, and education. And none of those things are bad, but you know what? We could put children in orphanages and they would get food, clothing, shelter, and education. Parents are called to give their children something much deeper than that. They're called to give their children values. One of those values is love. Another one of those values is sacrifice, sharing, taking turns, giving to others. Our Lady reminded us of this fact on December 25th of 2007. Dear children, do not forget that you are passers-by on this earth and that things can give you small joys, but eternal life is given to you by my Son, and that is why I am with you, to lead you towards that for which your heart is yearning. And what is it that your heart is truly yearning for? Is it material things and education and social advantages? Or do you yearn for heaven? And do you want to see your family together in heaven someday? 
But if we give our children the impression that the most important things we can give them are material things and education and social advantages, and we find ourselves cutting corners spiritually and morally, so we don't go to church because the kids have sports, or we don't go to church because we're tired from working, or we don't read the Bible or pray at home because we don't have time because we're doing so many other things and running the kids around to dance lessons and judo lessons and all sorts of other things that are all good in themselves, but there's no time or place for God at home. We have little hope of seeing those children in heaven one day because they're not learning the way to heaven. When the education of our children doesn't lead them to God, but rather leads them away from God, then we're setting them on the road to self-centeredness we're putting the focus of their world on what the world can do for them rather than on what they can do for the world, to paraphrase John Kennedy. And once again, Our Lady hits the nail on the head. Listen again to her words. You are seeking hope and consolation in all the wrong places. While well, I'm offering to you sincere devotion, which is nurtured by love, sacrifice, and truth, I'm giving you my son, and what did her son do for us? I pointed out to a number of people in confession this morning that Jesus gave, and very few people appreciated it then or now. When he was dying on the cross, his disciples had run away from him. The people who knew him and loved him the best, who had been with him for three years, who had witnessed all his miracles and heard all his teachings from his own lips, had run away from him. And the people who had cheered him with hosannas to the son of David when he entered Jerusalem were now jeering him and saying, if you are the son of God, come down from that cross. And Jesus did not complain about it. And he did not pout about it and say, I'm not going to do a thing for you. All he said was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And then he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He gave his life for us even though we would not appreciate it. Self-centered people could not do that. Self-centered people have a hard time accepting the church's moral teachings because every moral teaching of the church demands sacrifice and self-discipline. And we have all but lost those virtues. Again, think for a moment. When was your last confession before today? Our Lady has said, go every month for your own good, not for her sake, for our sake. Why haven't we disciplined ourselves to accept that message? We have all sorts of excuses, but we have all but lost the spirit of self-discipline. This doesn't mean, however, that we are completely lost. Last month, Cardinal Christoph Schoenberg in Vienna, Austria, who also is the author of most of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, he hosted a Medjugorje Peace Mass in his cathedral. And I thought this was great because this is right at the time we're getting all the bad press about Medjugorje, about ex-father Tomislav Vlasic, about the Bishop of Mostar again preaching against Medjugorje in the parish church in Medjugorje. This is all old news, of course. The Vlasic case dates back to 1976. And every year at confirmation, the Bishop Mostar preaches against Medjugorje. But for some reason, the media, even the Catholic media, is assaulting Medjugorje like never before. So I thought it was great that a cardinal of the church had Maria the visionary in his cathedral for a Medjugorje peace mass. And the cathedral, needless to say, was packed with people. And at the end of the mass, Father Schoen, uh, Cardinal Schoenbrunn said this, Regardless of what some people may think of Medjugorje, no one can deny that Medjugorje's reawakened in the hearts of countless people all over the world the spirit of prayer, the spirit of sacrifice, the spirit of personal conversion, things that have been missing in the lives of many until Medjugorje. And that is the truth. If there has been a revival of Marian devotion in many of our parishes, or of Eucharistic adoration in many of our parishes, the fact is that those devotions have been restored largely 
because of pilgrims to Medjugorje returned, imbued with the spirit of Marian devotion, Eucharistic adoration, asking their parish priests to start these devotions again in their own parishes. And many times the lay people themselves have had to organize them and direct them and staff them themselves. And it's, if there's been a revival of confession in parishes, you can likewise find that this is thanks to Medjugorje pilgrims, priests and lay people alike, who've been moved in Medjugorje to return to the sacrament of penance. And if there's been a revival of the spirit of penance and sacrifice, it can trace its source not to our bishops, who gave us carte blanche regarding Friday abstinence from meat. We all know well how well that brilliant idea turned out when the bishop said, well, maybe you can make your own choice. If you don't want to give up meat, you could give up something else on Fridays. So make your own choice. And what did we choose? We chose to do nothing. Because without guidance, without discipline, we are weak, selfish people. Thankfully, Our Lady told us differently from the bishops. She says not only to abstain from meat on Fridays, but to fast on bread and water on Fridays, and on Wednesdays if we can as well. And if you can't fast on bread and water, then for God's sakes, do something. Don't choose to do nothing. Discipline yourself to make some small sacrifice, and then you can move on to something bigger. And Our Lady's advice is not simply sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice. She says this in November of 1981, the year of the apparition's beginning. The devil is trying to impose his power on you, but you must remain strong and persevere in your faith. You must pray and fast. I will always be close to you. November 16th of that same year, the devil is trying to conquer us. Do not let him do this. Keep the faith, fast, and pray. I will be with you at every step. Persevere with confidence in prayer and in faith. But if we're not taking any steps in prayer and in fasting, how can she be with us? And yet Our Lady, like her son, has such great confidence in us. She looks into our souls and she sees that indelible mark that was made there on the day of our baptism, on the day of our confirmation, and she sees the inherent beauty that is ours because we belong to her son Jesus. So we listen to her message of June the 15th, 1985. Everyone's heart is like a lovely pearl. When a person belongs completely to the Lord, that person shines even in the darkness. But when a person's soul is divided, a little bit to Satan, a little bit to sin, a little to everything else, then the person's heart fades away and becomes worthless. In a very special way, dear children, I want all of you to become a reflection of Jesus and bear witness to this unfaithful world. I want you to become a light to all that you may testify to the light. And what Mary wants for us, we always say this, we remember this, Mary's asking nothing new that Jesus, her son, hasn't already said. Wasn't it Jesus who said, you are the light of the world, so let your light shine so that others who see you doing good works will give praise to your Father in heaven. I was very interested to read, to find again, this line that an ancient Roman writer had written about the early Christians in about the year 150. He says, they live near us, these Christians, right in our midst, but they do not abort, and they respect marriage. This is strange. Christian life was a total contradiction to the moral system of the Roman Empire. As I said at the start of this talk, our American Catholic forebears were also considered strange. They did not abort, and they respected marriage. Catholics were considered strange, but they were also respected by other Americans. All Americans knew that in those days, Catholic schools were the best. They knew that Catholic young people were being taught the ways of virtue. And other Americans may have made fun of Catholics for these things, but don't be fooled. Deep down, they respected us, and they even envied us. That's why there are very few movies or TV plots where Protestants are the focus of the story. I don't remember ever seeing the film, The Bells of First Baptist Church, <laughs> but everyone flocked to sing Bing Crosby and The Bells of St. Mary's, right? And Gregory Peck wasn't playing a rabbi in The Keys of the Kingdom. And Julie Andrews didn't get married in a Methodist church in The Sound of Music. 
The world was fascinated with Catholics. They envied us and they respected us. And because we were allowing ourselves to still be different while living in the United States, we were living up to the words of Jesus the Last Supper when he offered up this prayer on our behalf. Father, I'm coming to you now. I am no longer in the world, but these disciples of mine are in the world. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them for it, because my followers are not in the world any more than I am in the world. Father, make them holy in the truth, and, your, and the truth is your word. As you send me into the world, so I am now sending them into the world. And the glory which you gave to me, Father, I'm giving to them, so they may be one as we are one. My brothers and sisters, I worry that these conferences can become mere blips on the radar screen of our spiritual lives. That we can attend, we can listen, we can buy all sorts of little books and DVDs and souvenirs, we can clap away and have a great old time and walk home and not change. I really worry about that. Let's make concrete plans during this weekend to rededicate ourselves to living Our Lady's messages, to begin again to pray, to confess, to fast, to change our lives, and to make peace, especially with the people that we hold grudges with. And the last message, to make peace, is the summary of the other four, which is why Our Lady comes and says, not, I'm the queen of fasting, or I'm the queen of prayer, or I'm the queen of conversion, or I'm the queen of confession. No, she says, I'm the queen of peace. It is the summary of the other four messages, because if we are at oneness with God, as Jesus prayed we would be, then we will be at peace, and the church will be at peace, and the world will be at peace. But if we ignore God, and we ignore his teachings, and we try to reinterpret them and reinvent them, and say, oh, well, God really didn't mean that, or God will understand if you don't do that, pretty soon those teachings have no impact on our lives, and we are lost, and we will have no peace in this life or in the next. You know, this conference is not just any kind of Catholic conference. It is a Medjugorje Peace Conference because Our Lady is the Queen of Peace. And on February the 11th of that first year, she said, Pray, my angels, persevere. Do not let the enemy take possession of you in anything. Be courageous. Go in the peace of God, my angels. But Mary is not the Queen of Peace in the sense of the absence of war. She's not the queen of peace in that we're not fighting Nazis anymore, not fighting commies anymore, we're not going to be fighting Al-Qaeda sometime in the future. She is queen of peace for those who have given up fighting God. And we can count ourselves among that number at times. She is queen of peace for those who have not deserted Satan, who have deserted Satan's legions and joined Christ's army. She is queen of peace for those who are willing to stand up and take the oath to be soldiers for Christ. And I think we need to rededicate ourselves to that oath. The word sacrament in Latin means an oath. When a Roman soldier joined the legion and he took his oath to serve the emperor and the empire, he made a sacrament. And every time we go to Holy Communion, we are renewing our pledge to live according to the faith of our fathers and mothers, to live according to the faith of the martyrs, to live according to the faith of the people who have died for the faith so that we don't betray it. And I invite all of you right now at the end of this talk to stand, and we're going to renew our oath to Jesus. Stand up. This is not a stand up and stretch for you poor martyrs who are suffering in your little chairs there. St. <laughs> Augustine said that when he would make this baptismal profession of faith with his people in the cathedral of Hippo in northern Africa, that the response was so strong that he thought the roof would cave in. 
we don't usually get a strong response in Catholic churches today. But I think it's important that we rededicate ourselves to the oath that was taken for us that we took in baptism, the oath we renew every Easter, the oath we renew every time we go to Holy Communion and say, Amen. And so I ask you to say, I do, to each question. Do you reject Satan? I do. And all his works? I do. And all his empty promises? I do. do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, who rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, who died for us so that we might live, and who asks us to join him in his act of self-sacrifice for the salvation of the world? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who has guided the Catholic Church into all truth for 2,000 years? Do you believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This is our faith. This is the faith of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years. This is the faith of countless martyrs who have shed their blood for Christ rather than betray their faith. This is the faith of our fathers and mothers who lived and died so that we could be Catholics. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you all. I'm standing behind St. James' Church in Medjugorje. Inside, hundreds of pilgrims are getting ready to receive our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist. Now, you can receive the Lord Jesus at home right now just by inviting him into your heart and into your life. You can do that by just praying the short little prayer. So pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart and into my life. I ask, Lord, to forgive me for every offense I've committed. Help me, Lord, by your grace to amend my life. Help me become holy as you are holy. And help me, Lord, to live the life that, that you call me to live. Help me to follow you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, sincerely, Jesus is in your heart and is now a big part of your life. So... Look forward to a whole new life in Jesus. Amen. Amen.